Hey guys, Mass 6620. Um, the purpose of this video, and I will tell you, this is probably the most important video. I'm talking about getting dramatic here. Uh, the most important video that I'll post the entire semester. Uh, the reason is uh, this video is going to tell you, uh, or it's going to show you exactly how you're going to uh, submit your final project. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the final project. The final project, uh, you're going to be given a data set. I'm leaning right now toward letting you work in groups of two. I'm about 90% committed to that, so the, the meaning that I'm leaving open the option of changing my mind. I don't think I will, but uh, that's what I'm leaning toward right now, obviously 90%. Maybe 90.6732%, whatever. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's, where, I'm, that's where I'm headed. Uh, so uh, th th that's what this is all about. Um, let me tell you what's going to happen here. Let's uh, let's let's click this uh, this uh, link on Blackboard. Now th I'm putting this up for my spring 2017 class, but hopefully this video is just so impressive that I can use it from from year to year. Uh, that's that's the goal. Now, if you go to content and go to our week, and the uh, the week that I'm putting this up is uh, week 10, March 13th. Again, if you're in a in a future class, uh, it may be different, but. Uh, uh, you're, you're smart people. You can figure it out. All right, what I did the other day, I put up two videos. The only reason this turned out to be two videos is uh, I had a technical glitch in video number one, and this is the data set that went with the illustration of video one and two. But most importantly, uh, or at least um, uh, at least important, I think, is the illustration I want to give you today. And uh, so we got a couple things going on. First of all, there's going to be a lot of code uh, that I'm going to use an R to demonstrate um, uh, th things in this video. So uh, I, I provide that to you. I'll tell you what, let me just go ahead and open that up and, and show you uh, some of the stuff we have here. Um, we get into pr some pretty sophisticated uh, stuff down here at the very end. So I've gone ahead and, um, and, and given the code there, and I'm going to work through this example with you. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna minimize that, okay? Um, next thing I want you to take a look at is the OT grant resources, guys. I was part of a uh, a study with the occupational therapy department here at Shawnee State a couple years ago, and our study was uh, actually published, and and I just really liked the way that I wrote up and and conducted the logistic regression. Logistic regression. Uh, is a technique that is used uh, uh, a lot in education research because we tend to dichotomize, uh, you know, pass, fail, succeed, not succeed, true, false, things like that. Uh, got a question correct or got it wrong. So anyway, there's a lot of situations in education research where we dichotomize a dependent variable. So logistic regression is a really, really important uh, technique that we want to put a lot of focus on in 6620 because, again, in 6620, the purpose is to get you ready for your, um, uh, for your research sequence. All right, here's the data set. Now, guys, I've already downloaded both of these, so what I want to do is I want to go show that to you. Uh, here's the write-up. Uh, what I did, first of all, in this is I conducted a logistic regression uh, on certain variables, and the, uh, the dependent variable here was dichotomously coded as false status. So the, the patient either fell or they didn't fall. Uh, so that's why we use logist well, why I use logistic regression. Uh, I'll get into uh, to some of this stuff. Uh, I, you know, we get we, we look at the overall um, uh, test of our model. I'm going to show you how to find all this stuff. I'm gonna, we're going to look at McFadden's row. Uh, we're going to go through and we're going to talk about how I uh, came up with all this. Again, I'm going to show you how to do this. So in other words, guys, on your on your final project, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be just replicating this and writing up the results uh, with a different data set. Now, one thing I do want to tell you is you're going to have to do more here. Uh, let me just put this here. So uh, insert uh, descriptive statistics. So uh, you're going to want to, uh, or at least I'm going to want you to, I don't know if you're going to want to do it or not, 
you're going to insert means and medians and some tables and possibly some histograms, pie charts, uh, just depending on the, the, the type of data or the, uh, the data set that you get and what variables are included. Now, after I wrote this up, I came uh, down here, there was a second phase, and I did a backward elimination model. Now, I haven't talked much about this. In fact, I don't think I've talked about it at all. But there's a way in R and Minitab and SPSS and SAS where you can take a standard model, like a standard logistic regression model, and follow it up with a backward elimination model. What a backward elimination model does, it's a sequence. It'll go in and it'll find the, uh, the, the variable with the highest p-value. It'll take it out. It'll re-examine the model and see if eliminating that predictor improved your model. So did it become more statistically reliable, as we like to say? Well, if it did, then it, uh, it's going to look for the next uh, kind of least important predictor. It's going to take it out and re-examine things. So it will keep this backward elimination sequence of taking out the what it thinks by some, some algorithm, uh, what it thinks is the least predictive variable and see if eliminating it improves the, uh, uh, the you know the statistical uh, reliability of the overall model. So once it gets down to a situation where it takes out a variable and there's no improvement, then it'll put that variable back in and it'll stop after those iterations. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of backward elimination model. Uh, it's okay. It's used a lot. I'm going to require you to do it, uh, uh, backward elimination in your, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, final project. But uh, I, I'm just old school. I just like to say, okay, what do you think is going to happen? Set up your research questions. Uh, 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 come up with your experimental design. You test it. You write it up and, and go have a beer. Um, whereas backward elimination seeks to find the best set of predictors in determining the classification between, you know, this or that, true or false, succeed, not succeed, whatever the dichotomous variable is we're trying to uh, predict and classify. Uh, the reason we did backward elimination here is because the, uh, <laughs> quite honestly, uh, the reason we did, did it here is because the person who was paying the bill uh, and paying us a lot of money to do this said he wanted to see what was the best model. So I was like, yes, sir, uh, <laughs> I'll do that. So the next thing I did, finally, once I found the optimal model, it turned out there were three predictors instead of, what, 10 or so up here. Uh, what I did down there is I got into some um, receiver operating curve analysis. Uh, we get into, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, sensitivity and specificity. And I'll get into more of this about uh, there, there are different ways to, to, to minimize the difference. What, what we're ultimately looking at here is we're trying to find a model where the difference between sensitivity and specificity is minimized. Now, don't think about it minimized in terms of like a subtraction of the two values. Uh, there's all sorts of minimization algorithms, and the one I use uh, is the, um, uh, the, the MDT, the Minimized Difference Threshold. That's, uh, so if you... Uh, you're really bored you can look that up and, and figure that out but I'll talk about it just a little bit so so um, so guys we're going to talk about this and you're going to be prepared to do your final project and again I think it's going to be kind of cool because you're going to get to run through this with me and I'm going to tell you the way that uh, the way that I approach this now the first thing I did is I bring up the um, the data set and I'm going to go full screen here, and I'm going to uh, make this uh, make this larger. Let's go 150 percent. Now, when I first start looking at this, you know, I've got the variables that uh, that the uh, person kind of guiding the research wanted. Uh, ID wasn't important to me, so um, uh, I'm going to get rid of this. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in IDs. Uh, just ranging from one to uh, to whatever. And 
and then I can drag this down and I can uh, see how much uh, this this is a Darbro caveat this is just something I prefer to do uh, you may not you may say well, I, I really don't care about the that the sample size I'll figure it out once I get it into R and if you feel that way that's fine all right so I got 284 subject subjects in uh, in my data set uh, in my sample next thing uh, date is irrelevant to me so I'm going to delete that uh, age will keep that because I think that was uh, one of the uh, predictors we wanted included now the next thing is false status what we did here is we wanted to classify this dichotomously into either fell or didn't fall now I had some problems with this initially because I think there's a big difference between this patient who fell once and this patient who fell 20 times uh, the man paying the bill said well Doug no I don't care about that I want fall status did they fall or did they not fall so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and give the non-fallers a zero and the fallers a one so I'm going to uh, come to data uh, no I'm not I'm going to go to data I'm going to shoot what am I going to do oh here we go sort and uh, I want to sort so I'm going to give all these people zeros And I'm going to give all these folks a 1. Okay, the next thing I want to do is, which is very important, is to just kind of eyeball your data set and look for missing data. And I can see that the, the girl that coded this data came through and any missing data she put in A's. Now there are ways to take care of this by importing your, your, your data set into R and using something called a NA.omit or RA.omit. I forget I always have to look it up. Uh, that's not my style. I don't um, you might say Darwin you don't have any style but okay I would probably agree with that. Uh, I like to just go ahead and get my data set clean before I go into R. It's just my preference. It's kind of like, you know, with NCAA basketball season coming up, some people like Jim Bayham at Syracuse like to play a zone, and some people like John Calipari like to, to play man-to-man. -man. It's, just, it's just what it is. Uh, I like to clean it up here before I get into, um, into R. So, guys, for this particular question, uh, these variables right here aren't being used, so I don't see any reason... For them to clutter up my stuff once I get into into R. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to go through each of these variables and see if there's anything that raises concern. And the easiest way to do that is just to go sort and just eyeball our data. Well I've got some missing data here. Missing information. So I'm going to get rid of those cases that don't have values on the variable, one of the most important variables I'm going to use here, one of my predictors. Now, there's different schools of thought there. There's different schools. Of, some people say, well, replace those values with the mean. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, well, it's, it's not fine for me because I don't do it that way, but uh, I, I don't buy that, so I believe if there's missing data, let's just... Uh, Let's just admit we can't do much with them if we don't know what, uh, what, what's going on with them. Uh, next thing I'm going to do in this open six, I'm going to eyeball down through here and see if there's anything out of whack. Now, I'm not going to go into what open six is with you, but I know about the range of scores. So from 28 to, um, to 100 is believable for me. Next thing I'm going to just repeat this for the next variable. Uh, for open 8, starting at 46, about going up to uh, about 100 or so. Eh, okay, I, I suspect a little bit of that 100 down at the bottom, but I have no reason to suspect it enough to delete the people. Uh, this is an open travel 
it's another variable that uh, he included in his study. So I want to go down through here and eyeball this. Again, I know the study a little bit, so I kind of know what to look for. And it's kind of like if you're doing a study of ACTs, you know, ACTs are going to be about from, you know, what, a 5 or 6 up to a 36. Uh, so if you look down and see an ACT of like 40, you immediately know that you probably should get rid of that person. So now that 1.07 concerns me. Uh, I'm not so sure that... That's possible, but I'm not going to mess with it here. My point is just give you an illustration that you need to uh, to take a look at your at your uh, the measurements in each variable. Uh, nothing wacky showing up here. All those are believable. Uh, that 10.09. Uh, I tell you, my computer's running slow. That 10.09 is not possible. So that person is going to leave. Okay. Next variable is close six. So I've got some more missing data. Those people are going bye-bye. Uh, let's go ahead and look at close six the rest of the way. Make sure nothing's out of whack. They might say, well, why didn't you go ahead and have this done beforehand? Uh, well, because I didn't want to. I wanted to force you to go through this with me because it's an important part of, of data analysis. Um, okay, this 9.29, that's a measurement that's impossible to achieve. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of that. That's like me looking up there and seeing a ACT score of 68. Uh, can't happen. Uh, 115.58 can't happen. You might say, well, wow, who coded this data for you? Guys, I'm going to tell you something. She entered so much of this by hand. The fact that she only made two or three mistakes is uh, <laughs> is unbelievable. Uh, let's look through here. So everything looks good from there. The range of scores. Do you think I'm going to put in any wacky measurements in your data set for your project? Oh, yeah. You guys are going to have like ACTs of like uh, 3.2. See who finds it. I tell you what, my computer's going crazy because I've got so much running. Processors being taken to the edge. Um, okay, those can happen. And finally, the, the information that we get here runs from 65. Uh, up to 3.3. So guys, everything looks reasonable from, from there on out. So I'm going to go over here and uh, look at um, my IDs again. Drag them down because they will get off. Guys, when your computer isn't running, your the screen share uh, program, uh, you know things run a lot quicker. All right, so we got 250. Actually, uh, I think there were two more that I found in here someplace that um, that didn't suit me because if I go to my, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see that I ended up with 248 uh, patients. So uh, evidently, I deleted. 35 cases and not uh, what I've done so far is deleted 33 so but for the sake of going through this illustration uh, I'm not going to go back through all that and try to figure out uh, where the other two patients were that I uh, axed from the study all right so uh, it all looks good oh wait a minute wait a minute wait whoa 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 
gosh, this is annoying. I'm putting my processor to the test. Uh, there's one right there. We've got missing information. So there's one of them. And I thought I saw another one that had NA. Yeah, there's another one. So, uh, again, this OID one to whatever may not be your style, but uh, I'm kind of, oh, okay, so 248. So it actually did turn out uh, to, to be exactly what I had. So, guys, I'm going to go up here and do a save as. Now, let me back up before I do that. There's one more thing that I forgot. Uh, what we did in this, instead of speed for each of the open and close, we did a total speed and a total travel. So I'm going to go ahead and do that up here. I'm going to, and I'm going to uh, put it right here. So I'm going to call this uh, speed. And I want this to be the open speed plus the close speed. And yeah, again, could you have done this in R? Yeah, absolutely could have. This is, again, guys, this is just my style. And if my daughters were here, they would be like, Daddy, you don't have any style. And they'd probably be right. All right, the next thing we'd want to do is travel, total travel. So what I want to do here is I want to do the open travel uh, plus the closed travel. Someone once asked me one time when I did when I do consulting like this. Oh, there's another NA over there, guys. We gotta we gotta check that out. Because guys, you get an NA, it's uh, it's gonna throw you off. All right, what's going on? I saw another NA. Here we go. Okay, so I'm not really sure what happened here. So I think what happened, actually, I think uh, I'm going to be one off, and I think I know what happened. I deleted a, uh, a case earlier, and I didn't delete that case. Um, I delete all the NAs, but I didn't delete the case before. But guys, for the illustration, uh, I think you think you get the, uh, what I'm trying to do here. So guys, let's do a save as. Uh, I like to keep these things simple, just the name of data. Uh, I want to save it to my desktop because it's easy to find uh, with R. And I don't want to do the comma separated values. It's going to make you feel like an idiot and tell you you shouldn't save it and all that, but, uh, but we will. All right, so what I want to do now, uh, I've pretty much shown you now what happened in paragraph number one. Uh, I'm setting it up. I set up the total speed, set up the total travel, uh, talk about the deleted cases. Uh, I actually, because I was getting paid so much money to do this, uh, the guy compensated me very, very well. I actually went in and looked at these 35 cases to make sure that they were scattered randomly across the uh, uh, outcome and predictors, and there was no uh, significant difference there. Uh, that's something you definitely would want to do, uh, maybe not for your project, but definitely for your uh, master's thesis. Now... Next thing I want to do is I want to get into um, uh, how I come up with the information in, uh, in number two. Now, guys, again, remember, the, my numbers are going to be off a little bit because uh, I'm doing the analysis on 247 instead of 248, but uh, uh, just bear with me uh, on that. So uh, let's bring up R. Okay. 
And you guys should be really, really, really good at this by now. So... All right, so this is what I got. All my variables uh, are capitalized, so you know I've got to uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, gang, the first thing I'd want to do is I would just want to look at uh, a table of my uh, false status, and it turns out that I have 141 of my patients. Well, not my patients, but I'm I'm examining or uh, I'm talking about them. 141 uh, patients did not. Uh, fall and 106 patients did fall. So just something I'd like to know. All right, gang, let's go ahead and run our model. Uh, you should be really good at this by now. So we're going to run a GLM. So I want my fall status to be predicted by age, number of meds. Uh, so I have open six. Closed six. Is it closed or closed? Open eight. Close eight. Uh, travel. Speed. And react, I think, yeah. And up go. All right, you guys remember our family uh, is binomial. All right, so I want to do summary of my model and see what happens. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is look at my standard errors. I want to make sure that none of my standard errors are insanely high. Uh, that seems reasonable to me. And I will look at my p-values. And when I looked at my p-values, I realized that uh, nothing emerged significant. So, um, but y nevertheless, what, I've, what I'm wanting to do here, well, that's my daughter's uh, project. I don't think you guys care about that. Um, Well, trying to move this over. Exit full screen. All right, much better. So the second, uh, the second paragraph, I come in and do some some uh, kind of overall goodness of fit stuff. So the first thing I do is I, uh, I look at the chi-square uh, on the test of the full model, and I report it this way. And uh, again, mine's going to be off a little bit, but I want to show you how uh, I actually do that. Um, so uh, first thing you got to do is you've got to access a library uh, AOD. And so I've already installed that. So uh, if you haven't installed it, then you have to do install packages, quote unquote, AOD. And then I'll do what's called a walled test. And I want B to be equal to the coefficient of my model. Let me see, what did I call it? Uh, model, yeah. And then I want uh, sigma equal the variance covariance of the model in the terms equal. Now, the number of terms in the model, we're going to go, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, plus the intercept is 11. Um, oh, let's see what I did. I'll tell you what, guys, even when you do this as much as me, that, uh, let's see, sigma variance covariance be equal. Uh, 
All right, we got something going on here. Um, okay, there it is. Um, I had um, I had a uh, uh, parentheses in the wrong place. Okay, well, anyway, uh, you can see that my chi-square is 16.8. And again, you can see it's off a little bit because... Uh, uh, I'm working with a different sample. Uh, the degrees of freedom are 10. So uh, 10, actually, uh, darn it, that's not what I want. I have 11 predictors, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The intercept makes 11. Guys, my bad. I'm losing my mind here. All right, so... Um, Degrees of freedom 11, uh, chi-square test statistic of 19.4, p-value 0.054. So, uh, you know, you can see that uh, just taking out that one person uh, changed the p-value a little bit. So that's the way I get this information right here. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to get into the variance and false status uh, accounted for by the predictors. And we use McFadden's row uh, to do that. So, guys, let me show you how we do McFadden's row. So, what I'll do there is I'm going to run a null model. On, uh, so, I want uh, false status. But I want to run this on just the predictor one. So I'm going to run the, uh, the null model. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, look at the log likelihood. So I'm going to go 1 minus. Um, and I'm going to look at the ratio of the log. Um, let's see how, my, how do I need to do this. Um, so the log likelihood of our model divided by the log likelihood of the null. Uh, yes, that's what I want. So we can see here that the uh, McFadden's row, again, it was 0 0.046 with 248. It's 0.057. Now, that's still low, and that's just one of those things you have to get on Google and type in and um, and get the get the range of scores and, and, and tell you what that means. So, guys, there's the way you do McFadden's row. Uh, prediction success. Um, what I want to do there is I want to do a confusion matrix. So, um, so to get PAC, which is the percentage of accurately classified cases, uh, using 0.05 as a threshold. Uh, if you remember from the previous two videos, uh, we, we first came in and do our fitted values. And the next thing we're going to do is install our package. And I've already installed it, so this one works. So I'm going to use it. And what I'll do here is I'll uh, get my confusion matrix. So I'll have my false status first. And I'll have my fitted values. And I will do a threshold equal to 0.5. Um, okay, this is fun when this happens. Um, Okay, something uh, fitted. Uh, okay, something's gone wacky on me here. Um, you know what? Uh, let, me, let me see something. So I have seven. So length of false status is 247. Length of fitted is 246. Okay, that isn't cool. Um, all right, uh, yeah, that's no fun at all. So let's uh, 
let's, let's work through it. Uh, let's do a new data frame for fitted and false status. And did I include ID? Um, yeah, it's kind of, I, I wish this hadn't happened, but, you know, really, I'm actually kind of glad it, yeah, different rows. Mm-hmm. Well, let's uh, see if we can figure it out. Let's get rid of some uh, rows, make sure there's no lurking data down there. Hmm. So guys, there's got to be something in here it's seeing that it's not... Uh, there's got to be some missing data here someplace. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go figure that out. And um, well, let me try one more thing. Um, oh, I wish this hadn't happened. Let's uh, let's go to find and see if there's any place where we have an NA. Okay. All right, gang, uh, I'm going to end this video, and I'm going to start it up uh, <laughs> afterwards, and once I find the problem, uh, I'll tell you what happened. So I'm out of here.